put a food earlier down there at the big round table outside the kitchen. And the toilets are just at the back there. Anyone want you can go through that door to them. Michael, thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Good name you have there. Thanks, sister. Yep, sure. Introduce yourself anyway. Well, my name is Michael Stutman. I uh, have had an interesting few years in. Sorry? That you? That's fine. Right. You might Thank need you. it. All right, might need it. Okay, next slide, please. Is that working, Michael? Yep, it's great. It's great. This will tell me what I'm going to talk about. So this is what uh, the categories I'm going to discuss. Uh, first, we're going to look at a, a little video for about five minutes to explain why this plant, and it's just a plant, has been illegal or has been in prohibition for such a long time. Thanks, sister. Next slide. Do you want me to play that video? Yes, please. Play the video. Yep, it'll take a minute because we've got to get online to YouTube and play it. Maybe play it. <laughs> Keep talking. Okay. So the, re the reason for the video is just to give a, it's a journalist that explains quite clearly why things have been the way they have been for the last seven years. And when you understand that, you, you might understand why other people, when they think about medicinal cannabis, they think someone's going to smoke a, a joint or, or a bong or something. I've talked to politicians about it and they've got the smoke on their face and they think it's all about that from their high school days. But after a bit of education, they change their minds. They see that it's not exactly what people think it is. And there are two major kinds, as we've heard before. We've got um, CBD, cannabis oil, which comes from the hemp plant. It has no psychotrophic effect. It's not toxic, um, unless it's grown in a toxic environment. Generally, it's not toxic. It's produced in mother's breast milk, and uh, that gives babies a great start, and then it disappears again when they stop breastfeeding. So that's an, an interesting sort of a product, cannabis oil or CBD. The other side of the fence, of course, is the marijuana plant, which produces THC. And that has gone through a whole range of different strains and growths over the years. But I want to start with this one before I go much further. Sorry, no, that's all right. No, I can keep raving on. Um, so once we understand, I mean, when I, I, I became, I've been helping people with cancer for about 35 years. I have my own straight protocols. Is this it? Okay. Maybe we turn these lights off or not? No? Okay. strong enough to replace plastic, oil, and building materials. That the same plant has been cultivated for industrial purposes for over 12,000 years. Yet it's been classified as a Schedule One controlled substance drug by the U.S. government. Nope, not marijuana. Hemp. Recently, Kentucky Agriculture Minister, Commissioner James Cormer has requested a legal review of the steps necessary for hemp regulation. The federal ban is lifted on growing the crop. That's right. Kentucky could soon be reviving an industry that only a century ago was considered to be the most important cash crop and vital to the strength of the U.S. economy. So let's backtrack a little bit and talk about what hemp actually is. Throughout human existence, hemp has been used as an important source of fuel, clothing, shelter, and even food for people all over the world. In this country, industrial hemp was widely cultivated since America's first settlers arrived in the early 1600s. In fact, even our founding fathers acknowledged hemp's enormous benefits. George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all grew hemp on their private farms. And Jefferson was even quoted once as saying hemp is one of the greatest important substances of our nation. The Declaration of Independence itself was even drafted on paper derived from hemp. So what happened? How did one of the most versatile and adaptable species of crops in the world also become one of the most politically polarizing agricultural resources. Well, in the early 20th century, the plant became labeled a threat so dangerous that it should be wiped out. But it wasn't dangerous to anyone or anything except the industries that it could phase out of existence. 
So what did the establishment do to ensure their allegiance to the very industries they serve? Well, they did what they do best. They lied and smeared hemp through a propaganda campaign that associated the plant with marijuana. And in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act redefined hemp as a narcotic, which required farmers to obtain a special tax stamp to grow the crop. By 1970, the Controlled Substances Act made growing the crop without a DEA-issued permit strictly illegal. Because of the government crackdown on the crop, it has a negative association. And at this point, you still might be confused because of years of being brainwashed to think that hemp is exactly the same as marijuana, or that its close association with it must classify it as a drug. But this couldn't be farther from the truth. Just check out the Congressional Research Service report on hemp that states, quote, although marijuana is also a variety of cannabis, it is genetically distinct from industrial hemp, and it is further distinguished by its use and chemical makeup. So, hemp is genetically distinct from the drug, marijuana. In fact, if you smoked an entire garbage bag full of hemp, you wouldn't get high. Yet the plant remains illegal under U.S. federal law. And like I said before, not because it's a danger to people, but because it's a danger to corporations. In the early 20th century, hemp competed heavily with the cotton and paper industry. Because paper made from trees had to compete against environmentally friendly hemp products, the paper industry was at risk to suffer. So, William Hearst, a New York State congressman and one of the biggest newspaper publishers in America, launched a campaign against hemp. He used his publication to smear the public's perception of the crop, which at the same time was threatening a successful paper company. In fact, this very campaign is where the term yellow journalism derived from. But this was in the 1920s. How is the propaganda still working today? Because the threat HEP poses isn't limited to paper. Reviving the industry could potentially devastate the profits of huge corporations that manufacture lumber, fossil fuels, steel, alcohol, and even food, among many other things. Including this. In 1941, Henry Ford even built a car made almost entirely from hemp. The frame of the car was 12 times lighter than steel and 10 times stronger. Not only that, but the car was powered by hemp seed oil. Do I even have to explain the threat that this technology would pose to giant oil companies? Processed hemp also creates one of the strongest fibers we know of, providing all natural materials to build homes, ships, trains, planes, and automobiles and practically indestructible clothing. Furthermore, hemp seed oil can be made into lotions and skin creams. The practical applications for this plant are limitless, and the reason it remains illegal is simple. It's just one giant push to preserve the profits of corporations that poison our planet, destroy our forests, and bankrupt the world. But this all could change if recent efforts in Kentucky are an indication, and if moves by a few key members in the U.S. Senate succeed, hemp could soon be removed from the government's list of Schedule I controlled substances. The hemp industry could very well be revived back to being America's number one cash crop, and that's one step closer to succeeding against a model of profit, greed, and control that sadly defines this country today. Thanks, sister. So I think she said it all. Follow the money and find out why. The reason I play that video, even though it's American, it seems like the rest of the world followed that prohibition. And every country started to ban hemp and put it in the same category as uh, marijuana, which is similar species. I mean, it's the same species, just a different plant. So there was a lot of negative publicity. Some of it was very, very much politically incorrect. I remember um, seeing some of the ads that were on radio, and if you look it up, you can see it said things, and don't get me wrong, this is just what they said. They said only black sluts smoke marijuana, trying to put the whole public off, you know, utilizing the product. And they lumped hemp and marijuana together. Next slide, please. So, there is a difference. I mean, we legalize certain things because we can get sales tax, we can make money out of it because of lobbying. And alcohol is, of course, legal. And the difference between having a joint and drinking alcohol is stated up the top there. It's a very peaceful sort of a, a product. When the North American Indians, the tribes had a bit of an issue with the young braves, the 
old chief said, come into the teepee, the tent, pass the peace pipe. Peace pipe was full of marijuana. Everybody loved each other after they had a bit of that and hugged each other and there was no, no stress, no more fighting required. Next slide. Okay, so yeah, you know, it's the same species. But just like uh, in canines, dogs, are, you know, there's a huge variety. Take a Great Dane to a Chihuahua, for example. They're dogs, but they're very different kind of dogs. The same species with, with cannabis, you've got hemp and you've got marijuana. They're the same species, but they're quite different kinds of plants and they act quite differently. Okay, something I'm going to just talk about is the endocannabinoid system. It actually was in 1989 that someone discovered the potentiality in the human body, that this is a huge system they hadn't known about before. Then research started being done in the early 90s, and it wasn't called the endocannabinoid system. They couldn't work out why suddenly they discovered all these receptors in the human body, and trillions of them, and they didn't even know what activated it. And eventually they found out that cannabis activated these receptors, which is a real puzzle. Because how can something that the human body needs and wants has been banned for so long? And these plants have been growing, as you know, thousands of years. They also discovered that all vertebrates have what they now call an endocannabinoid system. It's, it's now uh, recognized as the second largest system in the human body. So first we've got our blood supply, and then the next, most, and the next biggest system is the endocannabinoid system. The activation of these receptors happens and those receptors are polished up when you start consuming hemp, CBD or marijuana, THC. These receptors are polished up and this is important because once the signaling is corrected the body and they called, they eventually called these receptors CB1 for the brain and CB2 for the rest of the body. So the brain, brain cell, etc. was CB1. Even though the CB, there was CBD and THC work on both. Slightly differently, but they work on both. So this explains why, and I, when people say, you know, it's, it's a great cure for this and the other thing, I state here, and some people are gonna get offended, but CBD and THC cures nothing, absolutely nothing. What it does, it allows the body to go into homeostasis or into balance. The effect entourages through to every part of the body and makes the body heal itself. They're the triggers and the signaling to allow the body to act on the different complaints the body might have. And that's why it works wonders for all kinds of conditions. So for, I'll tell you my journey in a second, but for the last year and a half, people have been asking me, you know, what should they do for this condition, that condition? So I have seen a lot of people and giving advice. And, you know, they have to do their own research. Anybody who thinks they know a lot about this topic is, is, is naive. I've spoken, like some of the others here have spoken, to many people from around the world, professionals, and uh, people that are doctors, researchers, professors, etc. And the big thing is, they all say, we know nothing. We know very little, because there are so many compounds in these products, we're not sure exactly how they act. All we do know is that they work. We're not exactly sure how, and we're still doing the research. You know, five years ago, there would have only been, uh, there were less than 300 double-blind clinical study trials being done on these products. It was hard to get the products in laboratories because of the illegality, supposed illegality of it. And in the last two years, there's over 15,000 trials being conducted, clinical trials. Half of them on cancer. Already a quarter of them have been published. That means peer-reviewed published documents. So when I sometimes accompany someone to see an oncologist for their cancer, for example, and they say there's no evidence for this stuff, you know, there's nothing, there's no clinical trials, the first thing they've got to do is look at their own journals. They're all published. They can have a look at them. Mind you, there are many, many varieties of cancer. And actually, it doesn't really matter what your cancer is or what your disease is. These products help bring the body into balance and allow the body to heal itself. So the endocannabinoid system is the second largest system in our body. If this system is in our body, which it is, then what activates it, as I said, hemp and THC, so marijuana and hemp, CBD and THC. So that's a natural thing for human beings to consume. In the wild, the animals, the herbivores eat them, the carnivores eat their stuff, and they, everybody gets this, except for us, because it's been banned. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so that's because I got here late. I couldn't fix this presentation. I didn't know there was anything wrong with it, but we can't move that down, can we, sister? No, that, that's actually the next one. That's it, stuck. Okay. Do you want to go to the next one? Yeah, look, this is just talking about some of the things that the products can do. In the next slide, yes. Okay, so there's some interesting buildings that have been built out of hempcrete, hemp concrete blocks. They're made out of hemp. They last longer, insects and bugs don't get into them, they're great insulators. That's just one product. Next slide. This is interesting. One of the reasons for prohibition was that, and it started in America with their biggest cash crop, hemp, is that it takes one acre of lamb to cultivate enough hemp to um, produce clothing, for example, compared to four acres of cotton that's required to get the same amount of clothing out of cotton. So you've got a, a situation where you've got land being used four times as much. The only problem with that is also is the pesticides that are used in cotton. So you don't need that for hemp. You can grow without pesticides. Now, dioxin and PCB are all around the world, these toxins. In fact, you've got to go to Antarctica to go 100 feet beneath the ice before you don't find it. In the most remote tribes in the world, the Inuk Eskimos, have it in their breast milk. That's how much we've poisoned the planet with dioxin and PCBs. So anything that stops doing that is a, is a very beneficial thing. Next slide, please, sister. Ah, <laughs> okay. Sorry about this. So this is Dr. Omoto. I'm going to come back to him later. He was the Japanese gentleman doctor who discovered that thoughts of human beings affects affect the crystalline structure of water. Some of you might have heard about him, he's quite famous. He used to have a whole lot of people go holding hands around a toxic lake and they'd take a water sample before and, and all the silly, uh, sorry, the crystalline structure of water was pretty ragged and ugly. And then after holding hands and all everybody sending positive thoughts to the water, it changed very quickly and the crystalline structure looked like snowflakes. So if you think about that, and later on I want to talk about cancer protocols, and the mind is one of the most important things. What are we mainly comprised of? Yeah, gases. H2O, right? Nit uh, oxygen, hydrogen together, forming water. So there's a lot of water in us. So if our thoughts can affect water in a bottle or in a glass or in a lake, your thoughts are very important to how it affects your body just on the scientific basis of water alone, besides other things. Next slide, please. <laughs> uh, it just talks about, sorry about the wrong positioning, it just talks about the cure for everything is right in front of our eyes, really. Next slide. Okay, so we're all over the place. Um, this is I'm just going to talk about uh, what happened to me in my journey. So we're getting off the topic of, of the, those products. In uh, May 2014, I had a little red spot on my forehead. I couldn't get rid of it with alkaline solution. And um, I decided to see the GP and he did a little tube with teeth and a little round twist. And he took a tissue sample out of my forehead to send away for a biopsy. Next slide. Oh, yeah, that's fixed. Yeah, I'm just fixing it as we go along. Oh, wonderful. Aren't you a genius? Thank you. You want me to go back to that previous slide? I can fix it. Oh, no, no, no. We'll just move along. Thank you for that. So that's just a little bit of history. And the next slide will come in a minute. <laughs> but it was just uh, as soon as you cut into a cancer, it starts to grow and spread. So that little matchstick sized uh, red spot I had and the uh, sample taken out of it grew that and started to accelerate the cancer growth in my forehead. And um, so it grew very quickly and then they had to do plastic surgery and gave me a Zorro mark or a Voldemort mark here to extract it. Again, the problem is once you cut into a cancer, even though they take what they call clear margins, they took a whole lot of skin away and gave me a forehead facelift type of thing, the, uh, it seeded. The cancer cells got out and seeded into my lymphatic system, into my limbs in my left side of my neck. Next slide. Uh, that's just for a bit of drama. I, um, 
after they took this out, they wanted me back at the hospital to check me over. They wanted to give me radiation. And I said, what for? They said, we do this standard thing for head and neck cancers. And I said, well, you put in the cart before the horse. Should we see if I've got cancer anywhere else? So they did scans and they discovered the lump in my left neck. And um, at this time, just before that, I lost vision in my right eye. They had an operation, I lost vision in my left eye. So that was just for drama. It's not, not the cancer story. So that's the, the lump on my neck there. And next slide. And that grew. Yeah, look, at this point, there was supposed to be a warning slide. Anybody with a weak stomach? Seriously, if you had a weak stomach or little children, you know, cover their ears and close their eyes and everything else. So it just grew and it broke through my skin. And at this stage, I'd been seeing various oncologists. In the end, over a two-year period, I saw uh, 28 oncologists, different oncologists. Quite often, you have to sit down and nine of them examine you and check your nasal passages, your teeth and everything else. They're all specialists in different areas of cancer. And then um, four other doctors, all over 32 doctors, all said there's no chance for life. Next slide. Yeah, warn the children for the next slides, apparently. Okay. So, it grew, and the really yucky ones I've kept out, because they've got all kinds of stuff in there, right? It was horrendous. And it, it went from there to here, on my neck. And um, you can understand why the doctor said there's no chance of life. And, and, and they were correct. I knew what the danger was that it would eat in my carotid artery and I'd bleed out. And on May the 9th, 2016, I woke up in the morning, I was feeling pretty good, a little bit cool, but pretty good. Touched the bandage that's there. My hand came over with blood and I thought, that's not good. Went into the bathroom, took the bandage off and my carotid artery was slowly bleeding out. So I raced to emergency, emergency, three emergency doctors, including an ENT surgeon, looked at this, put lights on it. They said, we could actually look into that hole and see your carotid artery, it's completely diseased. Mm -hmm. So you're going to operate? No, 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 we, <laughs> we can't operate. We're going to cut through your clavicle, we're going to try and somehow replace that. 99.9% .9 chance you're going to bleed out on the table. So what do you suggest? Get your affairs in order. So I did. And I said, how long have I got? They said, minutes to hours at the most. A hiccup, a cough, a sudden movement or a laugh. It's going to bleed out. I'm still scared of laughing because of it. <laughs> anyway, so they, they're expecting it to burst open and to bleed out. There's nothing much they could do. So they put me into a, a, a nurse's station there where nurses were all around and they put me onto different things, including, which I didn't expect, was 520 milligrams of morphine. Now that's 20 milligrams less than a lethal dose for my body weight at the time. They did that to make my passing comfortable. They also had a catheter in there and I said, what's that one for? They said, oh, as you're dying, we'll inject you with something to, to calm you down. I said, I'm not worried about dying. He said, well, some people get very anxious. I said, don't worry about it. I'll just bleed out and I'll be fine. Right? Just be dead. So um, that was what was expected. And um, it didn't happen, obviously. After nearly a month in hospital, I came out with a box that was here in a sling. It had a pump, it's called a driver, and it pumps in morphine to under your skin with three other drugs to help combat the side effects of morphine. It's things that does to your bowel and to other things that are unpleasant to talk about. So that driver failed once. I didn't know what was going on. I was going through massive withdrawals, ended back up in hospital. All up, the cancer was easier to get rid of than the morphine. But you can understand why they thought I was gonna die. So, um, and you know, and I didn't. There might be all kinds of reasons for that. It's around this time, just before I went to hospital, I thought, you know, I've tried every known modality that I know of to treat cancer, including new ones that had evidence based from around the world. All different things. I knew that, no offense to anybody here, but that may be an oncologist, but I didn't, I knew that radiation and chemo weren't the answers. Because if you look at cancer, Dr. Otto Warburg got the Nobel Prize for discovering the cause of all cancers. And you know what? That's not taught to the medical community because then they'd have to think outside the box. Otto Warburg discovered that it was anaerobism, which means lack of oxygen, 
that causes cancer. And that's caused by acidic condition, which is caused by toxins. So all toxins create an acidic condition, and that means oxygen cannot be utilized, and then cancer, which is not the enemy, it's the last resort, goes there to stop you from dying earlier. Because if you've got a site in your body that's, that's not getting oxygen, all the cells die. And it just falls out of your body or falls internally as a dead piece of whatever, depending where it is. So cancer cells are activated and they go to the site and create their own community, their own blood supply, and uh, they look around if there's anything else around that might need attention, and then they go to those acidic sites. So if you want to treat cancer, you go, you've got to treat the underlying cause, which is toxicity. That toxicity could be your thinking, could be what you drink, what you eat, what you breathe, etc., what comes through your skin. And that creates acidity. And that acidity, when you have acidity, oxygen can't be utilized. So in your blood, you have a pH level of 7.3435. That pH means it's alkaline. So 7 is neutral, 6.99 is acidic. So seven and above is alkaline. If your blood pH drops below that, the body's automatic autonomous nervous system says we need to buffer the blood because if the blood isn't alkaline, you cannot utilize or transport oxygen. So without oxygen, we're a big combustion engine. All the cells are individual combustion engines. All need fuel, oxygen, and heat. So if you remove oxygen from the equation, that's the end of that combustion engine. So in our bodies, oxygen is crucial, so the pH has to be buffered. So what the, what the body does is, where do we have alkalinizing minerals? And there are four, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. I'm not talking table salt. So these four minerals are required, they're all alkalinizing. So we have a huge storehouse of those minerals, especially calcium, it's in our bones. So what happens is, if our blood pH drops down, the body automatically take some calcium out of our bones to buffer and alkalinize the blood. That's why as you get older, people start to shrink. Or they start getting brittle bones because the body needs to become alkaline in the blood that's pulling out calcium and things like that. That's one of the reasons. There's many other reasons. So the pH is extremely important. So if it drops to 6.99, all that tissue, all those cells will die. What saves the day is the hero cancer. Comes to help. Trouble is, it's like letting a bull out of a gate, right? It just keeps trampling sometimes. Anywhere else there's toxins in the body, it travels to. So when people get, for example, chemotherapy, which is one of the most toxic products in the world, all the studies now done by Harvard and other medical schools and cancer universities around the world say, oh, wait a minute, chemo is really interesting because if it's targeting those cells, it might kill those cancer cells. It actually creates cancer in the surrounding cells and it goes to different parts of the body. So I've helped people out that have had pancreatic cancer, people that have only had six weeks to live because they couldn't get any more chemo. And it, of course, that side of toxin, the liver has to cope with that toxin, that was the next place cancer goes. So I know when people are very toxified or they're getting chemo, it might be in remission for a while, then it comes back and it goes to the liver, because the liver's been trying to cope with all that chemotherapy as well. So this lady couldn't get any more chemotherapy because it detoxified her liver, and she had now liver cancer as well, and given six weeks to live, that was a year ago. So a friend of hers said, you might talk to this guy, he, he recovered from cancer, he might be able to help you. So I spoke to her and suggested a dose of CBD and THC, and she's alive. Her cancer count, I've never seen one so high, was 14,300. It's down to about 160, 170 at the moment. I'm going to get down to 30, and there'll be no more cancer for her. So she's a survivor. And she's not the only one. Many, many people. I could have put slides up of brain tumors of people that sent me their MRIs and said, look, since we've been using these products, look how the cancers have shrunk or disappeared. And it's not just cancer, you know, because of these receptors in our brain, let's say CB1 receptors in our brain, they get plaqued over. They get plaqued over from the things we eat, drink, think, smoke, whatever. And then uh, pharmaceuticals pass the blood-brain barrier and start to, plug the, uh, start to coat these receptors. And what happens is that the signaling becomes poor. So people get things like Alzheimer's dementia, they get Parkinson's, MS. 
So, um, I mean, four people that I know of that have been using the products uh, don't have Parkinson's. Irreversible, supposedly incurable disease. So, there are many of those diseases that are supposed to be irreversible, incurable, that I have seen personally reverse with these products. Now, uh, next slide, please, Sister. Okay, back to my little journey. So yeah, I um, researched CBD, and I've got to thank the Hemp Embassy here, um, because I sent an email off. I was looking for the best, most viable whole of plant extract at CBD. I sent an email here, and um, that person, that gentleman, uh, sent me to another site, another location, and uh, discovered an importer of uh, what at the time was the best CBD available, which comes from Denmark. And um, I got that and got THC, so I broke the law and I survived. I broke the law just before I went to hospital, and in hospital I was a bit vague, and friends and family said, have you taken your oils yet? And the hospital didn't know I had them there, they were sitting in a drawer, and I was taking CBD, THC, on and off, I wasn't thinking too clearly at the time. After I was discharged, I was taking it regularly every day. And then I uh, moved, I was living in Brisbane, I moved to Yukai here because the energy is great, the food was organic, and I had a friend that wanted to look after me. So I was able to recover. And it took about four and a half months for that hole in my neck to become clean. And the inflammation, which was down to here, everywhere the purple inflammation went, the cancer went. The inflammation, which was down to here, retreated back to the hole. And every day I would have nurses come out and change these bandages, six layers of bandage, because it stank to high heaven too. It was a fungating tumor. So, um, and it was messy. There was all kinds of crap coming out of it all the time. Pretty, pretty horrible. And every 10 days a doctor would visit me and said, you know, we know you're optimistic, but you know there's no coming back from this. You know, expect a kilo over any day, <laughs> right? So um, when I saw that wound clean up, which was the right picture before, um, I knew the cancer had gone because it looked very different to what it was. And the nurse said, look, it is very different. We'll get the doctor to come out. And he came out and the wound had cleaned up again a few more days later. And he said, look, you know, I don't know if the cancer's gone or not, but you cannot leave a hole like that sitting there. You know, if you let it go naturally, it'll take three months to close up. You have these huge scars and folds of skin. You won't be able to turn your head any, any which way any which way because of the scarring and he said we're going to do uh, have to do a skin graft I said okay hang on for a second you're going to do a skin graft what are you going to take it out of? He said, out of the cheeks of your butt right so we're going to get two half moon shapes take them out of your butt put them there so I said I'll be under a general anesthetic he said yes I said I don't want to do that he said oh they know what they're doing I said no so we've checked with the biggest addiction specialist in the country who's based in Canberra Nobody's ever come off, nobody's ever had 520 milligrams. One survived that. Two come off it, because if you have a normal operation, you could be getting 120 milligrams, maybe for a day or two, then they stop it, because these opiates are very addictive. So they didn't, um, so I said, you know, they said, oh, but these anaesthetists know what they're doing. I said, no anaesthetist in Australia has ever put someone under that's got 520 milligrams of morphine in their system. I said, I've got to get rid of this morphine and I'm not going to be operated on. I might not come out of it. And he said, no, 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 they know what they're doing, they're experts. So when you tell a doctor, and I've told over 32 doctors, my GP said to me, you've told over 1,300 years of medical expertise you've said this to. I said, I've never said that. I said, I'm just not going to do what they want me to do because there's no survival. There might be an average of five years survival. They do everything they wanted to do and that's it. At seven years, there was no survival for head and neck cancer for what I had. So I said, I'm either going to die or I'm going to live, but I'm not going to do it that way. So he said, well, we, we know you've told a lot of doctors you don't want to do, but this is finished now, Michael. You know, we, we don't know if the cancer's still there or not, but we've got to close that hole up. And I said, no. And when you say no to a doctor, you know, you, you're threatening their knowledge, and I don't want to threaten their knowledge. I just don't want to do it for myself. So in the end, I said, look, I'm a single man. You know, I might in the future meet a lady. And if she snuggles or kisses me on the neck, she's kissing my butt, I said. <laughs> so 
when you tell a doctor that and they get a smile, they say, oh, okay, you know, he's crazy, let him go. <laughs> but you know, you're going to have this hole, it's going to take three months. Well, actually, maybe it should have. But I, I got a feeling that CBD and THC not only clean up the cancer, because I tried everything else, there's nothing left. And it cleaned up that hole within one month. And the scarring that I've got is just what I've got left there. In fact, if that scarring fades, nobody will believe it ever happened. <laughs> but it, it did. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, this is what I believe is the protocol for fixing cancer, and it's probably all diseases. The most important thing is the mind. I talked about Dr. Omote before about how our thoughts affect water, and we're mainly comprised of water. Our thoughts affect us very, very interestingly. And getting the mind set right is the most important thing. I have seen someone, I know someone with a three and a half centimeter tumor that listened and practiced the four agreements, and when they got them, that tumor went from nothing overnight. It went from a three and a half centimeter tumor to nothing overnight. And it can't be disputed because they had a scan a couple of weeks before that that showed the tumor there. They had a scan two days after it disappeared and the, and the radiologists were very surprised because it had gone. So that, you know, you've got a two week period, but it was really overnight. I've seen others in three days get rid of throat and, and tongue cancers because of their mindset. The mind is the most important thing. Also, everybody that's got cancer has an underlying anger. Now, I, I was a, a very peaceful person. I taught and lectured on the politics of nonviolent change and did all seminars on, on happiness and peace. And I didn't think I was angry. And then I thought I'd check it out. Went to a very good acupuncturist that can do the pulses. I said, just do my pulses. What's wrong? I said, you tell me. She said, wow, your liver pulses through the roof. I said, what is the emotion? I already knew, but what was the emotion? attached to the liver pulse. She said, anger, you're really angry. I said, I don't feel angry, but I have an underlying anger. So I started to practice the four agreements. And, you know, the headings are very simplistic. The teaching underneath is brilliant. In fact, it should be compulsory in all schools. We'd have a different humanity because it creates happiness and love in your life. And forgive yourself and forgive others. Love yourself and love others. Very important mindset for cancer. You've got to do that. You've got to get rid of that anger You've got to forgive yourself and others and love yourself and others. When that kicks in, you might not need anything else. But the second most important thing I discovered after trying every other protocol available is CBD and THC. You've got to have the right kind of CBD and THC. Medicinal cannabis is all the news at the moment. People are investing it, growing it, and extracting it as cheaply as they can. And, and the quality control might not be there. You might be growing plants in an environment where there's toxic rain, or soil or water. So it's very important to get a very clean organic product that isn't destroyed in the manufacturing process. So CBD, cannabis oil, if you get the plant and if you cold extract it under pressure, so CO2 cold extraction under pressure, you get whole of plant extract. You don't get it destroyed. THC is different. You've got to dry that, heat that and everything else. That's not the issue. You get full blown, good quality THC and uh, but CBD is different. There's only, and I, I'm inter pleased to say that a gentleman approached me a couple of months ago to have a talk to me, and I thought he might be talking about his health. He wasn't, he was granted the 13th license in Australia to produce medicinal cannabis. And this is in Brisbane. I said, in Brisbane? I said, where? He said, Waco. I'm thinking pollution, pollution, plants are gonna be toxified. I said, oh yeah, and in what condition? He said, well, he had his phone there. He said, under the glass house, we've got all the air filtered, the humidity is correct, the nutrient for the plant is correct. We monitor everything. It's totally isolated from the outside environment, but it's still getting sunlight through the glass. And he said, that's how we're doing it. I said, oh, very good. So I think, oh yeah, at least it's not going to be a toxic plant. And tell me, how are you going to extract this plant? He said, oh, the consultant said, because these people had no idea about medicinal cannabis. They just knew that it was a commercial opportunity and had no idea about anything except what they're told by their consultant. They said, oh, the consultant said we have to extract it under pressure with CO2. 
I said, that equipment is very expensive. He said, you bet it is. He said, but they said that's the best way to do it, to get the best plan. We believe we've got one shot getting the correct product. Then I asked them about their plants and everything else and their cost and uh, estimated retail value. So they're going to have product by the end of the year. And that's going to be interesting because it's one of the few places in the world that is extracting the product properly. And that is very important because oils, as the old ad said, ain't oils. You've got to get the right kind or pastes or oils. Um, okay, so the second, oops, second, nearly swallowed it. Second thing was, of course, CBD, THC, get the right CBD, THC. The third thing, of course, is going to get your, you've got to get your gut right. You've got to get your digestive system working properly so you can extract the nutrient the body requires to heal itself. So CBD THC will set up the body to heal itself, but it's got to have the nutrients there to help it do that, vitamins and minerals, etc. And this digestive process has to be correct. So you can get probiotics to help populate your gut. Remember that chlorinated water will kill off your flora in your gut. Also, a lot of our meats have uh, antibiotics put into them because they don't want to lose the flock or the herd. So that's an automatic thing, and that's not dissipated much by slaughter and cooking. So you get antibiotics regardless in those kind of meats. And these things, again, kill off our internal flora, which is very important. That's where the final digestion is. So getting yourself a good probiotic, and I'm not talking about going to a chemist and getting one with three different lactobacillus, etc. You need a wide variety. You need lots of it. So you can grow your own. You can get something called water kefir or milk kefir. They're like a grain bacteria, you feed them sugared water and it converts that. Water kefir creates about 25 different probiotics, also creates CQ10. Milk kefir does about 35. And with milk you give it organic milk, it eats up all the lactose and what's left is like a, a bit of buttermilk. And the water kefir tastes a little bit, you know, bitter, but it's, it's not unpleasant. And those help repopulate. People use kombucha, other kinds of, kind of uh, probiotics. It doesn't matter. Get the gut working properly. That's very important for your immune system. Talking about immune system, uh, latest research shows and things are changing all the time. What we thought was correct two years ago and 20 years ago, and the internet will tell you all kinds of information, is changing rapidly. So with CBD, it's now considered the world's greatest anti-inflammatory. Nothing comes close to it. So most of our illnesses come with inflammation, so that's not a bad thing. Okay, alkalizing diet. I've helped people out with cancer just on diet and detoxing. So an alkalizing diet means the food you're going to eat isn't causing acidity in your body. And that can be tricky because let's say we take a glass of orange juice and a glass of lemon juice and we pH test them, they're both acidic. When you drink the orange juice, because of its molecular sugar structure, it becomes very acidic in your body. If you drink lemon juice, which is also acidic to start with, because of its structure, it becomes alkaline ash in your body, which is very good. So getting, making your body more alkaline is crucial, so we can use oxygen. So cancer's got no more reason to exist. Yep, yeah, okay, refined sugar cancel gobbles up. Cheese, which a lot of people don't expect, it gobbles, it loves cheese, it loves an angry mindset, and it loves meats. They're all acidic, producing foods. Okay, and if you can detoxify, as I said, the process for cancer is toxins, acidity, lack of oxygen, cancer cells are activated, etc. Unless you can change your lifestyle and change things so cancer is no longer a reason to proliferate, you will knock it off. And detoxing is important. If you can get into a far infrared sauna, they don't operate like a Swedish sauna at 105 degrees centigrade, which is very stressful. You can start perspiring like crazy around 35 degrees centigrade. The radiation, safe radiation, because we get it all the time. We actually emit far infrared radiation from our eyes, our hands, and our palms ourselves. That's why cats will always get under a palm or where you're looking because they pick it up. They love the sun because part of the radiation is fire infrared radiation. So if you go into a sauna like that, it penetrates that deeply, aggravates the, not aggravates, it vibrates the uh, water molecules where fats, uh, in cells where the fat, uh, fat cells where toxins are stored and it releases that. And 85% of those toxins come out of the surface of your skin. 
If you go into a Swedish sauna, it's so hot that the body does uh, release toxins, but usually in your bloodstream, in your, in your liver and your kidneys have to cope with those toxins again. So there's two ways of detoxing. So I would suggest far infrared sauna if you can. That's very helpful. Next slide. You know what? Years, a few years ago, um, certain large industries that produce all kinds of drugs and tablets and injections and whatever you want to call them, they, um, they said, well, we can't beat this movement. We're going to join it. They started producing their own CBD. And because they don't have the resources or the time or the desire to cultivate the hemp plant naturally, they look at what they can extract and what they can synthesize. So they came out with synthetic CBD. Now, they had access to a lot of doctors. This didn't happen in Australia, it happened overseas. And each doctor said, now you can have CBD prescribed to your patient. You've just got to keep a record of how they progress. So you have to do what we call a clinical observation, once a month report in how their progress is going. Everybody on synthetic CBD went downhill, died or became worse with their illness. And that documentation was then given to the government and said, you know what, no antidotal evidence, forget all that nonsense. We've had trained professionals, doctors, doing clinical observations, providing this product, and all these people have become sick or dead. Ban it. Don't allow it to go any further. All right? Interesting. So we've had some strange things happen in this country as well. Okay, so forget synthetic. You need whole of plant extract. Next slide. Yeah, look, when it came to my own cancer, th there wasn't that much really around regarding dosage. I could listen to the importer and things, and I took six drops of CBD and six drops of THC daily, not at once, because the THC was a very strong THC. It took me a little while to get used to it. If I took one more drop, I'd have a psychotropic effect, which meant I was off my face. But um, my body built up to six drops a day, two drops three times a day of CBD and THC. You take them together because CBD on a ratio of five to one to THC can mitigate some of the psychotrophic effects. But I was taking two and two, so there wasn't that much mitigation if I took an extra drop accidentally. So that's, that was my dosage. And um, people say it wasn't too high, because some people have rung me up and said, look, I'm taking 20 drops of THC at night. <laughs> I fell off my chair. I said, 20 drops? He said, yeah. I said. Can you help me with the dosage? I said, no, I can't. I can talk to you about the products that I know, and you'd only take two drops at night. You know, if you took 20 drops of this product, you'd be on your back for three days wondering what the hell happened. So the potency is different, and you can't dose correctly unless you know the potency of the products. So CBDs come in 3%, you know, 8%, 15%. 20% uh, which was required for the Australian market they decided they wanted the manufacturer to produce 20% they did for Australia they've now produced a 30% percenter. very expensive though you're better off getting a 20% or and taking a little bit more of it to equal a 30% uh, strength in tier, uh, CBD yeah next slide Exactly. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, that's like my mind. <laughs> Another slide, sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that no more? There were a couple more. That's it. Okay, it didn't get emailed clearly. Yeah, look, I, I wanted to say that to, to Nimbin. First of all, uh, what you've done is you've kept plants growing in this region and it was tolerated because of people fighting for the right to use a plant to save their lives for either medical purposes or recreational purposes. I had slides up there about all these different conditions that it fixed, that I've observed fixing uh, myself. 
But Newman, I've got to thank you because of what you did. You put me on to the right people with the right product and uh, that saved my life. And so this community here is, is I'm very grateful for what you've done. I just wanted to thank you. Well done, Marcus.